Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about a dumb decision made by Herm Edwards during last Saturday's game between Arizona State and Eastern Michigan that eventually got him fired. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want you to imagine this scenario. Imagine next year that tight end Mercedes Lewis somehow is still playing. It's week one of the 2023 season, and the Green Bay Packers are traveling on the road to play the Chicago Bears on Sunday Night Football. Because somehow, NBC executives haven't realized that this isn't a good idea for a Sunday night game. And in the first quarter, under the lights at Soldier Field, Aaron Rodgers steps back and hits Lewis for a touchdown. Aside from the fact that it gets the Packers on the board, the catch is a big one, as it means that Mercedes Lewis has caught a pass in 18 straight seasons, as he began his career as a member of the team you've been watching this whole time, the Jacksonville Jaguars, back in 2006. It gives him the record for most seasons in NFL history by a tight end with a catch. Is this really a big record? Eh, to diehard football fans it is, but to the average football fan, not really. It's not like the touchdowns record, or the rushing yardage record, or the sack record. And compared to baseball stats, especially with what we're seeing right now with Aaron Judge and Albert Pujols, where every at-bat is must-see TV, it pales in comparison. But this record that Mercedes Lewis, in this hypothetical scenario, set, took place at Soldier Field on visitor soil. Do you expect the PA announcer working the mic at Soldier Field to announce to everyone that Lewis set this record? and expecting the fans to stand up and applaud him? Of course not! You can probably count on one hand the number of records in football, where if it was set by a visiting player, officials of the home team would make note of it, and it makes sense as to why that's the case. Why would a home team have any incentive to congratulate a player on the visiting team, especially when it's not a huge record all things considered, and when it's arguably their biggest rival? Well, in 1983, that's where an absolutely insane controversy happened between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cleveland Browns, when the teams met at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. Because there was an absolutely massive feud that took place in the fourth quarter that had nothing to do with the players on the field. Heck, if you were watching the game, you had no idea about it, because it was never mentioned during the broadcast. Rather, the entire controversy took place upstairs in the press box, and made owner Art Modell furious in a game that his team won. This whole controversy is bizarre. It's stupid. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you bet that's what we're going to be talking about today. Because this is the story behind the dumbest moment in the history of the Steelers-Browns rivalry. Before I talk about the actual moment in question, we need some context to understand the game at hand, as well as the record that was being broken. It's December 18th, 1983. It's the final week of the regular season, and we have an AFC Central rivalry game on our hands between two teams that absolutely hate each other in the Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And this was a pretty big game, pitting the 10-5 Steelers against the 8-7 Browns. For the Steelers, they had already clinched the AFC Central, winning the division for the first time since 1979, although their number three seed was pretty much locked into place as the Dolphins were 12-4 after winning on Friday night, so they couldn't pass them, and the Raiders were 11-4 and were playing a San Diego Chargers team that had nothing to play for and that they just trashed 42-10 two weeks ago. So for all intents and purposes, barring a miracle, they were the number three seed, and they just wanted to go into the playoffs healthy. But for the Browns, this game meant way more. The AFC playoff picture was an absolute mess, especially after the Browns following an 8-5 start and looking destined for the playoffs for the third time in four years, dropped two straight games. They needed to beat the Steelers, hope that the Seahawks could beat the Patriots at 4 o'clock, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, and hope that the Bills could beat the Falcons. If those three things did not happen, then their playoff hopes were toast. So to say that this was a must-win game for the Browns is putting it lightly. That's what this game meant from a standings perspective, and in the end, for at least a few moments, the Browns were still alive, as they defeated the Steelers by a final score of 30-17. Granted, this would mean nothing in the end, as down in Atlanta, the Bills would lose 31-14 to the Falcons, destroying Cleveland's playoff hopes right then and there. 
but the Browns at least took care of business on their end with this 13-point win. Quarterback Brian Seip, in what everyone expected to be his final NFL game ever before jumping ship to the USFL, had a great day, throwing four touchdown passes and no interceptions while posting a passer rating of 132.4. It was a great finale. Pittsburgh's quarterback Cliff Stout, on the other hand, did not. He went 7 for 21, completing 33% of his passes for 94 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, five sacks, 59 net passing yards, and a passer rating of 28.7, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Two out of three ain't bad when talking about meatloaf, but when talking about how many passes Stout threw that felt incomplete, yeah, it's not good. Pittsburgh played an extremely sloppy game, losing the turnover battle and committing 11 penalties, and it did not look like they were going into the postseason on a high note at all. This was not a good game for them on any level. But for the purposes of this story, the outcome of the game is irrelevant, because it was during this game that something happened involving this man right here. This is Franco Harris, and he is one of the greatest runners of all time. I would be here all day if I talked about the fullback and just how great his contributions to the Steelers were, to the point where this season, he will become just the third player in Steelers history to have his number retired, as even though it's been unofficially retired for years, officially after 2022, no one will ever wear the number 32 jersey again. Harris made nine straight Pro Bowls from 1972 to 1980, was named the MVP of Super Bowl IX, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, led the league in touchdown runs in 1976, was an anchor on Pittsburgh's offense during the 1970s when they went on one of the greatest dynastic runs in football history and won four Super Bowls in six years, and was not only named the AP Offensive Rookie of the Year in 1972 and the Walter Payton Man of the Year in 1976, and was not only named to the all 1972nd team, but as we would later find out, would be inducted into the Hall of Fame on the first ballot to the shock of absolutely no one. And by this point, Harris had the second most rushing yards in NFL history, with 11,894 yards. The only person ahead of him was Jim Brown, who was still quite a ways away. If Harris was going to pass Brown, it wasn't going to be in 1983. So don't worry, that's not what this story is about, because that's an actual record that the average American cares about. But how do you run for the second most yards in NFL history? Well, Besides being really good, you need longevity, and you need quite a few seasons running for over a thousand yards. The thousand yard benchmark is the true sign of a running back or fullback having a great season. Heck, it was such a coveted benchmark that in 1972, when Atlanta Falcons running back Dave Hampton crossed that mark in the final week of the season against the Kansas City Chiefs, becoming the first player in Falcons history to accomplish this feat, they stopped the game to honor him only for him to then lose yards on his next carry and finish the season below 1,000 yards. To do it once is impressive. To do it twice is truly exceptional. But what about to do it seven times? Because that's where Harris was at entering the 1983 season. He had 1,055 yards in 1972, 1,006 yards in 1974, 1,246 yards in 1975, 1,128 yards in 1976, 1,162 yards in 1977, 1,082 yards in 1978, and 1,186 yards in 1979. And even though Harris hadn't had a 1,000-yard season in nearly half a decade, having yet to do this since Video Killed the Radio Star, entering this game against the Browns, there was a highly realistic chance that this could happen. After finishing 1981 just 13 yards shy of that benchmark, and being on pace to reach the benchmark in 1982, if it wasn't for the strike, as he was on an over 1,000-yard pace, through the first 15 games of 1983, Harris was sitting at 951 rushing yards, thanks to a 103-yard performance in Week 15 against the New York Jets that made people believe again that he could do this. All Harris needed to close out the season was 49 rushing yards, just 49 measly yards, which is a total he reached 118 times before, and he would have a 1,000-yard season. But this wasn't just any 1,000-yard season, because by this being the eighth season crossing a 1,000 yards in his career, he would set the NFL record. As things stood, the record was seven seasons of a 1,000 yards, which was a three-way tie between Harris, Walter Payton of the Chicago Bears, 
and Jim Brown of the Cleveland Browns. Harris was tied for first. With 49 rushing yards in this game, he would be all alone in first place for the most thousand yard rushing seasons in NFL history. And by no means was this easy. Unlike the Jets game the previous week, Harris really had to work for every yard he got, as entering the fourth quarter, Harris had still yet to cross that benchmark. It got to the point where even the announcers were wondering whether he could pull this off or not, or whether it was too little, too late. Listen to what Bob Costas, who was calling the game for NBC as the play-by-play -play man, had to say about it. I wonder whether Franco will get the 49 yards he needs today to reach 1,000 for the season, which would give him a record eight times doing it. He needs 49, does he not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But despite their doubts through three quarters, after a 15-yard run on Pittsburgh's first play of the fourth quarter, it was official. Franco Harris had more than 49 rushing yards on the day, which meant that he was now in sole possession of first place for the most thousand-yard rushing seasons in NFL history. And here's how it sounded on the broadcast. Here's Franco. He's got it. He's going to get it with this carry. Congratulations. That's nice. Unofficially 15 yards on that carry, over 1,000, eighth time NFL record. Congratulations, Franco. And he is certainly not hanging on, is he? It truly was a great moment for Franco, and was just another reminder of how great of a player he was. For him to run for over 1,000 yards at the age of 33, when a lot of people thought he had nothing left in the tank, was truly remarkable. Sure, the game hadn't gone to plan. The Steelers were down 30-10 to 10 at the time, and were seeing their slim hopes of playing a home playoff game in the divisional round go down the tubes right before their very eyes. But at least this was a bright spot. You couldn't take this away from them. And while the Steelers were happy for him, they also had a request to the Browns. Be happy for us too. Acknowledge the fact that Franco just broke this record. Make an announcement over the PA system that Franco Harris was now the all-time leader in a thousand yard rushing seasons. And what followed was an absolutely insane controversy. Because at first, Cleveland's response was, understandably so, why the heck would we do that? There were quite a few reasons why Cleveland was extremely hesitant to announce the fact that Franco Harris broke this thousand yard season record. Number one, it's not like he broke it by a lot. It would be one thing if after that carry, Harris was at 1,040 yards. But Harris only finished the game at 1,007 yards, having about 1,003 yards after that play. One bad loss, or a few losses of a yard or two, and that record could easily go away, just like what happened with Dave Hampton with the Falcons back in 1972. And no one wanted a repeat of what happened with Dave Hampton. That wouldn't be good or ideal for anyone, especially since, on Franco's very next carry, he actually lost yardage. Number two, it's not like this was a marquee record. Sure, it was important to some. It was important enough for it to be mentioned on the broadcast. It was important enough not just for Bob Costas to mention it beforehand, but know in real time when it was broken. That's the sign of a great announcer. There are some records that you have no idea whether or not they're broken until after the fact, when someone from the research and stats team for the network does some digging and comes back with something out of the TV timeout. This wasn't one of them. At least some people, including some very important people, knew about this record. But that doesn't mean it's a marquee record. Most rushing yards in a game? Yeah, that's one of the biggest individual game records out there. Most rushing yards in a season? That's a really big deal. Most rushing yards in a career? That might be the biggest record that there is. But most thousand yard seasons? It doesn't really hold the same weight as other stats. It's like the difference in baseball between the home run record and the record for the most doubles hit in the leadoff spot. It's noteworthy for sure, but it's not going to move the needle a whole lot for the average American, especially the average football fan. Number three, and the obvious elephant in the room, oh yeah, Franco Harris was playing for the opponent, who was on a rival team. You're out there fighting for your lives in the final game of the regular season, where you absolutely have to win if you're going to make the playoffs. You're going against a team that you absolutely despise, and might be your most hated rival at the moment. You're going against a team that have been very aggressive all day, to the point where earlier in the game, Jack Lambert got ejected. 
You're going against a team where there's nothing but bad blood. And with all of that in mind, you're going to have the public address announcer come on the PA system and congratulate a rival player for doing something against your team? Doesn't seem like the best idea in the eyes of Cleveland officials. And number four, and perhaps most importantly, it's not just that Franco Harris set the record. It's that Harris broke the tie at first place that he had with Jim Brown, who was a franchise legend. It'd be like if a running back ran for 300 yards in a game against the Vikings, and they wanted the Vikings to announce that Adrian Peterson's record was no longer intact. It'd be like if a man recorded his record-breaking 23rd sack of the season against the New York Giants, and they wanted the man upstairs at MetLife Stadium to make it known to everyone that Strahan was no longer in first. It's not going to go over well. It's just rubbing salt in the wound and dancing on someone's grave right in front of their family. Still, officials on the Steelers may not one, but two requests to the Browns that Harris broke the record and they should acknowledge it. The first time the request was made, the Browns simply ignored it. But the second time it was made, it led to a giant profanity-led spat between the two sides. Kevin Byrne, the publicist for the Browns, said that he refused to announce to all the fans that Franco Harris broke the record, beating Jim Brown. But Joe Gordon and John Evanson, the publicists for the Steelers, weren't pleased with that answer. They were furious at Burns' refusal, so much so that eventually, tensions got so heated and they got so persuasive that they got Burns to call up owner Art Modell. Burns said what was happening with the Steelers' officials and what they wanted the public address announcer to do. Just like Burns initially declined for obvious reasons, so did Modell. Even after the Steelers officials and Burns said that they didn't have to announce that Franco Harris beat Jim Brown's record, and merely that he had eight seasons of a thousand rushing yards, Modell still hated the idea. Byrne then got off the phone with Modell and let the Steelers officials know that the phone call did not go well, as Modell was extremely reluctant to do it. That's when John Evanson, in a fit of rage, said, do whatever you want, but if the situation were reversed, we'd do it. And just as Byrne was cursing Evanson out, Evanson hung up. The Browns and the Steelers were not just involved in a heated battle on the field, but they were now involved in a heated battle and a war of words in the press box. Finally, the two sides, after a ton of arguing and a brutal stalemate lasting practically the entire fourth quarter, came to an agreement. The run happened with about 14 minutes left in the quarter. Well after the fact, with just about five minutes left in the game, the Steelers got their way. Franco Harris's record would be announced over the PA system. And as the PA announcer broke the news to everyone that anyone who cared about the record already knew by now, the Cleveland fans got up out of their seats and applauded. They rose to their feet, waved their caps, and began chanting Franco's name. It was an incredible moment of respect in the rivalry. Franco then shed tears at receiving this acknowledgement. He took his helmet off, tipped it to the crowd, waved, and hugged his coach, Chuck Knoll, as a two- I'm just kidding, they booed the ever-loving crap out of him. What the heck did you expect? The Steelers were making such a big fuss over this announcement and wanting the Browns to acknowledge one of their own when the fans literally drowned out the announcement with boos to the point where you couldn't even hear it. And literally everyone but the Steelers saw it coming. Of course the fans were going to be upset that a rival broke Jim Brown's record. Why wouldn't they be? especially since the fans aren't in the best of mood anyways, seeing as the Bills are losing heavily to the Falcons and the Browns can't make the playoffs now. The Steelers and their publicists were the real-life equivalent of Mr. Burns, when he genuinely thought people were applauding his movie by saying Boo Burns. It was a disaster, and considering the circumstances, might be the stupidest and dumbest controversy over absolutely nothing. So what's the moral of the story? If you're playing a rival and one of your players breaks a record that, while is a big deal to some, isn't an absolutely historic record that the average American cares about, and you expect the other team to honor your accomplishments, then you're absolutely delusional and incredibly self-centered. The fact that the Steelers were trying to get the Browns, in the middle of a must-win game, to take time and honor Franco Harris, and they genuinely expected the Cleveland fans to not have something to say about this by drowning out the announcement with a chorus of boos, was insane. Because when the Browns announced this record to their crowd, let's just say that it did not receive 
an immaculate reception. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.